The ETF industry has been in the business of disrupting and improving investor outcomes for the past 30 years. ETF providers sit in the front line of all that innovation. Here, we get to hear their stories and find out what it takes to be a disruptor. This is ETF Wavemakers. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to ETF Wave Makers. I am Cynthia Murphy, Head of Research for the ETF Think Tank. And today I'm joined by Young Lim, co-founder and CEO at Folio Beyond. Hi, Young. Hi, Cynthia. I'm glad to be here. I'm very excited to, to be here with you today. You know, for for the sake of the the namesake of our show, Wave Makers, uh, you and your firm are doing some really interesting things in the space. So definitely making waves, and I'm excited to get into that. Uh, so I think let's start by by learning a little bit about you and and your journey into this industry. Um, I was I was dissecting your LinkedIn and and your history, and I just my first question is how did a Caltech electrical engineer uh, end up in the ETF business? What's the story there? Oh, good, good question. Uh, there were a lot of uh, trips uh, in between. Uh, but in general, when I graduated from Caltech, uh, I wanted to be in the financial industry. So uh, one way to do that would, you know, would be to get an MBA. So I got an MBA at the University of Chicago, you know, somewhat quantitative as well as a business school, majored in finance. And naturally, I ended up in a more quantitative area of the fixed income markets, mortgage-backed securities. So that was in the late 80s uh, when the mortgage market was still sort of in the early stages. Certainly the securitization market was uh, in the early stages and we were creating um, four tranche structures. And fast forward to today, some of these CMO deals are uh, you know, made up of 50 tranches or so. So anyway... Going back to your question, uh, it's the quantitative uh, uh, experience and background that really helps in analyzing mortgage-backed securities, analyzing structures, and in terms of how how these uh, strategies uh, can be utilized in uh, as an RIA or as an institution. Uh, we, I, I guess, my quantitative background also helps out in portfolio analysis and uh, stress testing and stuff like that. So let's let's get to how you apply all of that what, to to Folio Beyond. I think it's interesting that you know as a firm uh, you define yourself as a technology platform, and uh, that can be interpreted in so many ways. Uh, you have you know a big reliance on algorithms. You talk a lot about the the modular algorithms you use. You talk about you know advancing uh, sophistication. Uh, some really interesting things that are not exactly a run of the mill ETF provider. So, so tell us a little bit, what is Folio Beyond and how is it that you tackle the business of improving investment management? Sure. So Folio Beyond was set up to uh, deliver advanced uh, portfolio solutions using you know, the latest analytical tools, uh, including AI whenever uh, appropriate. So, you know, just going back to the 80s when I started in the business, uh, you know, some of the advanced analytics involved uh, using spreadsheets and uh, <laughs> macros on Excel spreadsheets. You know, fast forward to you know, five years ago, there there were a lot of advanced analytics that were available that you could customize and data had become cheaper. So you're, you're able to access a lot of uh, different data. So the genesis of Folio Beyond is to apply these advanced tools uh, to the fixed income market. And, and the nice thing about the ETF market was that unlike 20 years ago, the ETF market had grown quite a bit in the fixed income market and you had all these uh, sector ETFs. So our first product uh, was the uh, advanced optimization fixed income model utilizing 24 ETFs. So it's a technology platform in the sense that we are using optimization techniques. We are calculating forward-looking option adjusted yields on these different ETFs. We're incorporating uh, risk analysis, correlation effects, momentum effects. So all of that uh, is what uh, is uh, what supports our technology platform. But at the same time, we're an investment manager because we're not just using a black box. You know, our 
collective experience and our understanding of the capital markets, uh, risk return trade-offs and so forth, all of that has helped us develop the right tools uh, you know, that's appropriate for investment managers and institutions, as well as retail investors. So how has uh, how have ETFs as as a product as a, as a technology in itself in a way uh, helped this business or really impacted your ability to to build all these models that now you can partner up with all sorts of firms to to deliver solutions to? Yeah, so I'll talk about two different levels. So one is as I was saying with our fixed income model, ETFs has allowed us to optimize a portfolio of ETFs. And we were careful not to include overlapping ETFs. So the 24 sector ETFs, which includes our riser ETF, have exposures that are fairly discrete. So you have short, intermediate, long-term treasuries. You have corporates, high yield, tips. So what, what we're doing is taking these uh, disparate ETFs and constructing an optimization model with the right risk constraints so our initial model was to optimize the portfolio, targeting the uh, volatility of the Barclays Act, which is roughly three and a half percent. So given the same risk constraints, can we do better than the Barclays Act? There, you know, ETFs are critical. If we were to try to implement this using actual QCIP bonds, you know, buying individual corporate bonds and uh, TIFs, it would have been very challenging, you know, and first of all, you wouldn't be able to do it in small sizes. So the ETF uh, market and the diversity in the ETF market made it possible. Now, the fixed income market in the ETF space is a little behind uh, equities in terms of diversity of products. And, you know, we, we found gaps, some major gaps in the ETF space. And one major gap was MBS interest only strips. So it's a sector of the MBS market where institutions have invested in this sector for decades to you know, manage duration, to enhance portfolio income. And so we, an op we saw an opportunity to introduce that product uh, as a first mover and work with Tidal in uh, growing the ETF. Yang, this may be like a silly question, but uh, you know, the focus on income, is that because this is an area that you are very passionate about? Or is that because, to your point, you saw an open space, an under uh, underexplored space, and so there was opportunity there for product development, and that's why you chose that segment? Well, it, it was a combination of uh, income and, and having a risk profile that uh, was very beneficial for RIAs. So in my experience, you know, having income uh, is a great thing, obviously, uh, so uh, you know, whenever you're in a trading range or even even if uh, the markets are volatile, the income component gives you that cushion. So, uh, well, we have uh, generally focused on income products and MBS IOs uh, fit that uh, mold. Now, in terms of the sector itself, uh, we thought it, it, it was a good product to introduce to the ETF market because it's actually a fairly large sector, 120 billion, and it has a unique profile of producing income, but at the same time giving you interest rate protection. So that combination is very hard to find in the fixed income world. If you generate a lot of income, you're going to be long the market or long duration. So in our case, we are short duration and generating very respectable income uh, to the tune of 7% uh, plus in the current environment. So it's, it's a risk return profile that we thought was very helpful for portfolio managers, and it, ha it has multiple applications. Tell us a little bit about how you are working to, I guess, grow the business is the best way I can think about it. But really, you know, you are on, on some ways, you're a service provider. You're interacting with different firms that come to you for these solutions. Uh, how What has worked? It, the ETF space is very competitive. The model space is very competitive. So in your experience, you know, what have you learned that, that has helped to grow your footprint, get your story out there? How challenging has that been? Yeah, part of the challenge with our kind of ETF is you know, the, the complexity, you know, for people in the mortgage market, 
it's almost second nature. You know, you, you're you're getting interest only cash flows from the underlying MBS. So if you think about the sensitivity to prepayment changes, you, uh, as rates go up, prepayments slow down, and you have interest cash flow flows for a longer time period. So that gives you that uh, negative duration profile. But you know, for the uh, for non MBS uh, investors and especially for people who have not been involved with different types of collateralized mortgage obligations. You know, there's an education process. So we've uh, tried to, it is actually fairly straightforward in terms of the relationships and uh, how the portfolio is constructed, but it still requires education. So we've spent time on uh, educating people. We've spent time on uh, discussing ideas on how it could be utilized, whether it's in combination with other ETFs or how it uh, diversifies a typical fixed income portfolio or even equity portfolios. It's shown to have good negative correlation to tech stocks. So that that that's a, a good benefit. And at the end of the day, uh, we think this product adds alpha or as well as uh, improves the sharp ratio of portfolios. So Education has been challenging, but you know we uh, have experience uh, with uh, you know writing up different pieces. Uh, so we have uh, worked hard on providing the right set of materials. But at the same time, we have to be mindful of the different levels of knowledge people have. So that's been a little bit of challenging. It's hard to sort of uh, set the tone at the right level to cater to all different types of investors. Uh, Distribution has also been challenging. You know, it's a problem or challenge that everyone faces. I think as a baseline, you need to have a good product, uh, but certainly the product doesn't sell itself. So uh, we've been working on uh, being uh, discussing partnership opportunities. We, we are in the process of getting on different platforms, but size begets size. So we have to work on getting beyond certain thresholds before we can qualify for certain platforms. And all of that requires patience. But at the same time, we still believe that uh, having a robust underlying strategy is, is uh, certainly a key uh, ingredient to success. And you know, we, we've certainly done a good job, we think, on, on the investment strategy itself. And now the ongoing challenge is to expand distribution and to be creative and as well as just uh, knocking on doors to make sure that we have uh, uh, we're, we have been turning over all the stones in terms of expanding our distribution effort. Yeah, it, it's interesting because the, the longer we are in this business, the more we learn that you cannot overestimate the power of good content uh, you have to go meet the the investor, the potential new client where they're at. And, and that a lot of times takes a lot of effort, a lot of content, a lot of education to your point. And uh, I, I think, you know, it's also just as important, if not more important, that the product is good. Uh, we talk about that as a necessary condition for success. The number one is the product has to solve an investor problem. It has to be the right product or you can market all you want and it's not going to get anywhere. And what's interesting about, you know, Riser, the tickers R-I-S-R, um, is that it's a really unique product. It's an alternative income product that there really isn't uh, anything out there quite like it. And you guys are about to hit your second uh, anniversary on the product, right? In September. So it's coming up on, on two years old. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, time flies. So I didn't realize it was only, uh, I guess, a month and a week away. But uh, we we have generated strong returns, you know, very good returns, I guess, relative to benchmarks. Last year, last year we were up, up above 30%. This year, year to date, we're up close to or or over nine percent, and uh, you know, last year rates obviously went up a lot, so that that was a part of the return attribution. But there were other elements in in uh, the returns that helped us generate strong risk-adjusted returns both last year and this year. And I want to point out a couple of things. One is security selection. So uh, we are an actively managed fund. Although the MBS interest-only strip market is 120 billion plus, 
Uh, they trade by QCIP. You have a variety of coupons, maturities, uh, dif differing collateral characteristics. So there, there is a uh, an opportunity for experienced traders and investors like us to identify undervalued MBSIOs. So by picking out undervalued MBSIOs and uh, managing the overall portfolio risk the right way, we're adding security selection alpha. And that's demonstrated by the return comparison versus the indices versus the MBS. It's called the CSIO index. That index is uh, maintained by Bank of America. We've outperformed that index by more than a few hundred base points versus a treasury benchmark, a benchmark that shorts treasuries. Uh, seven seven years or so, we've outperformed that probably by more than 10%. So I think the security selection alpha has been good. Another thing I want to point out is we actually do better when MBS yield spreads to treasuries widen. So a lot of people have credit risk in their portfolio, including uh, MBS securities, you know, generic MBS securities. When MBS spreads, yield spreads widen to treasuries, that leads to slower prepayments in the primary market and improves the valuation of MBS IOs. So our strategy also does better when all your spread products are suffering. And that, that's been another component of returns uh, that has helped us. So yeah, it's, that's it's, just the it, overall summary. Yeah, it's it's a great uh, diversifier. Uh, it really is an alternative source of income, uh, which is a it's a fascinating concept. And congrats on the on this upcoming second anniversary. If there's a party, let us know where it is. We will come. <laughs> so I'll, I'll me, let you yeah. guys organize it since you're we're partners in this. <laughs> sure, sure, we're on it. So you know, as you look back uh, in your experience in this industry and in the ETF business in general. Have you found the journey rewarding or, you know, it because it's a hustle, it's competitive, it's difficult. Uh, is it rewarding? Do, are you are you happy to be in here? Are there things you would have done differently as you build your business? Any lessons that we can take here? Yeah, it's, it's certainly been rewarding. Uh, uh, let me talk about the pros first. You know, this is a business where you can really scale very effectively. It's an efficient process for creating new shares. It's an efficient way of bringing in an institutional product to the retail marketplace. And certainly institutions have uh, embraced the ETFs as well. Um, as a side note, our ETF is also approved by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, and we have the second highest rating. So uh, insurance companies can invest in our ETF and get very favorable capital treatment. Uh, so those things are all good. Uh, and it's also rewarding to offer a risk return profile, as I mentioned earlier, that's very uh, complementary to what people own. And it's, it's certainly a value added uh, to existing portfolios. The, the challenges are uh, some of the, you know, some relate to some of the things we mentioned already. It's, it's related to distribution. It's related to education. Uh, it's related to, uh, uh, application. Uh, it's also related to, uh, you know, some of the processes that larger firms go through when they're approving new ETFs. So as an anecdote, uh, we were talking to a, a fairly large uh, wealth management shop and they like the product. They like the underlying securities. The, the, the hurdle for them was educating a new product to their investor base. And they, they were concerned about, you know, you know, providing the right level of education. So it was it was basically uh, more of a herd mentality. You know, if if a competitor, a competitor were offering this product, uh, you know, same size competitor, then they would probably jump on it. But they don't necessarily want to be the first ones. So it, it's those kind of challenges. So I guess the first few years is uh, a slog you really have to be patient you know some of my colleagues don't like it when i say that <laughs> you know we all want to want things to happen much quicker than uh, we uh, 
than in than how things play out. But uh, um, you know, patience I think certainly has paid off, and I think will continue to pay off as we got onboarded to Investnet uh, just uh, recently. Uh, so we have, our fixed income model is on Investnet. Uh, a bank client is in the process of uh, doing their final uh, investment committee discussions to allocate to our fixed income model. Uh, we are close to qualifying for some of the larger platforms like LPL. So we we have to, I guess, be patient and work on getting to certain milestones as quickly as possible to get to the next level and so forth. But once you're past, I guess, I don't know, 250 million in size, I think uh, that there's a huge amount of scalability. Yeah, it's it's interesting because this really is not a business um, for short the short term. It's uh, this is a business for one for a long term, but it requires conviction. To your point about patience, if you don't believe in what you're doing, uh, it's hard because it can take time. We I think we do a little bit of a disservice. We love to talk about the overnight success stories. But in truth, there's rarely, if ever, such a thing. Uh, it it takes time to build. But I, I also think to your point about the education, the hurdle, the complexity, I'm curious to see how it unfolds in the next wave of product development in the ETF industry, because you know we've always been all about simplicity. But the truth is that the products are getting more complex. Complexity is a new thing in the ETF space. And, and a lot of the products coming to market are really interesting, but they're really intricate. And so I, I'm curious to see how we're going to digest complexity and uh, implement it in a faster, more streamlined way so that we can we can see dissemination of some of these really, really interesting products. What do you think is is interesting or what catches your eye when you look at the the trends in the ETF space, both in product development or in the way people are allocating and investing in ETFs, anything that stands out to you? I agree with you. Some of the interesting products will add value to the whole portfolio management process. Um, I, I guess certain strategies have uh, caught on very quickly, uh, such as the uh, the option overlay strategy, where you're generating a lot of current income. What what investors have to be mindful of is is the overall risk profile. So, you know, we, we've been in a certain environment the past. Uh, 12 months. So some of these uh, option strategies have worked well, but how does it work when you have a bigger move or when you have a whipsaw scenario? So understanding uh, some of the uh, scenario uh, analysis and, and stress testing, I, I think more people need to uh, perform and understand. I, I guess that's part of the role of uh, some of the uh, model portfolio managers, like you guys have a model portfolio, we do as well, and others have as well. You know, these model portfolio managers need to have a robust approach in in combining ETFs and providing the rise return for profile. I mean, what, what would hurt uh, the industry for some of these uh, unique products would be if, if the product is misunderstood and there are surprises uh, when, when you have a unforeseen uh, circumstance so i mean i i also unfortunately i come come across fixed income products where the risk profile is misunderstood by investors mm -hmm. and as a fixed income guy if i look at the underlying portfolio i can sort of summarize the risk profile but that that may not be how the end investor understands it so i think education is important to your point and we all have to work hard at it and uh you know, transparency is important. Um, you know, there's no free lunch. So if you have a certain risk profile, you have to uh, present that, you know, show the upside as well as the downside. And as long as uh, you have a well-educated investor, uh, that's a win-win situation for everyone. Yes, absolutely. And patience is important. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and congratulations on the upcoming uh, milestone for Riser and, and all the success. And um, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. Thank you very much. This was a good discussion and looking forward to the uh, two-year celebration. I'll invite you to the two-year celebration. <laughs> I'll be there. I'll be there. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. We will see you next time.